Hello, and welcome to History and Lowell with me, Maritza Grooms, and our wonderful Robert Ferrand. So we've been talking a lot about immigration in Lowell for about a year now, I think. Just yeah. about. Wow, that's incredible. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it certainly has. We've gone from the 1800s up until recent immigration, yes. and up until even the International Institute and the work that they're doing, and the work that they have been doing, and then we got a really great treat when your your buddy, Professor Christoph Strobel, came in to talk about the Native Americans who are mm -hmm. here prior to all of the right. other immigrants, At including the, real the new English. <laughs> so, wow, let's look at these trends and patterns. Mm -hmm. So we know that the immigrants um, that were coming in the late 1800s were coming from Ireland and places over there, and then we go into uh, the French Canadian immigrants and the Portuguese and the Greeks. So they all were coming for different reasons, but kind of similar reasons, mm -hmm. and they all had similar experiences coming here. And then we even talk about um, the whole immigration reform and the quota system. So, how does that all look from a broad perspective? In 25 <laughs> words or less. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that it, you're right that, I mean, in the time span that we've looked at, we've started with the Irish coming in, even as early as like the 1820s, all the way up until, Im, you know, recent refugees coming when um, people were here from the International Institute. And so there's a commonality to everything, which is that Lowell historically, through this whole 200 years of history, basically, that we've been, um, that we've been looking at, was a place where there was work. And so one of the, so people might have left Ireland or Quebec or Portugal or Greece or wherever for a slightly different reason based on what was happening in their country. The draw why so many people ended up here is the mills. The mills were a beacon of hope. And so while sometimes looking back, we think of that work as difficult, noisy, hot, dangerous, dirty, low paying, all of which was true. It was significantly, significantly easy for me to say, it was significantly an improvement from the particular situation people were emigrating from. And so that's why Lowell, Lawrence nearby to where we are, Fall River, New Bedford, Holyoke out in western Massachusetts, Springfield, even further west in Pittsfield, those cities were draws for immigrants. I, what was fascinating to me is I gave a talk last night, I gave a history talk last night in Ipswich at the Ipswich Historical Museum, and I did a little research about Ipswich, and I always thought of Ipswich as this very white, very rich place, right? That's my stereotype of Ipswich. Mm -hmm. Little did I know there was a very violent strike that happened in Ipswich in 1913 where a young Greek woman was shot and killed during the strike, and there were several mills in Ipswich at the time that produced hosiery, stockings. It was the largest hosiery mill in the country was in Ipswich. Wow. Never knew. <laughs> I grew up in Beverly, which is like 20 minutes away, and wow. I always thought of Ipswich as rich and white, right? Nope, wrong, right? <laughs> and immigrants, largely Greek immigrants, went there for the work that was there in Ipswich in wow. these hosiery mills in Ipswich, Massachusetts. So wherever, I think when you're, if you're a, a New Englander, or whenever you're riding around and you're going to New Hampshire or Maine or wherever for vacation, wherever you might go, if you see a big red brick building, you can almost be certain that there's an immigration story connected to that building. Wow, wow. and that's, that's really um, where the cradle of maybe the revolution of the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting to know that where everything was getting started. It was all immigrants. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the mills in Lowell were built largely by Irish laborers, not exclusively, but largely. Every single canal, so if you're in the listening audience and you've been on a canal boat ride in Lowell that the National Park gives, or you've just walked around and seen the canals, um, you know, the Venice of the United States, mm -hmm. um, whatever. <laughs> um, just look at, all, look at those canals and think again, Irish immigrants. Um, St. Anne's Church, which is a beautiful structure in, on Merrimack Street in, in downtown Lowell, is made out of brick that was dug out of the earth to build the canals. When they were done digging, they had big piles of rocks that they didn't know what to do with, and they <laughs> said, okay, let's use them and 
make the church. And so, wherev- almost wherever, again, almost wherever you look in Lowell, there's an immigrant story and or today a refugee story. Wow, that, that's just so incredible when you're really thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's good in a way as a historian because I like this stuff, but it's bad in a way as a historian, historian because it's like I can't turn my brain off. It's like, oh yeah, there, oh yeah, there. <laughs> you know, and it's sort of like, it's like a, a, you know, if you want to be a history detective in Lowell, you can go into any neighborhood and uncover a story, an old market or an old diner, or they all have some cultural significance immigration, cultural, historical significance. I think that since I've been, since we've been doing this show together, I also have a new lens. Every time I'm walking down Market Street, I just think of all of the Greek coffee shops that might have been there. And even having like significant Greek population up and down that street, you Mm -hmm. see remnants and vestiges of things that were there hundreds of years ago. Yeah, again, and sort of like, so now you're cursed with the historian's bug, right? <laughs> and so, but right, and I think that's, I mean, the other thing that's interesting is that while Lowell, and we've talked about this, but just to sort of go back over it again, while the city celebrates in some way that history, there's also a history in there of the city making determinations to knock a lot of immigrant neighborhoods down. And we mm-hmm. talked about urban renewal, but in the, um, in the 1960s, Little Canada, the fr- largely French Canadian neighborhood, just gets dev- it just it gets bulldozed to the ground. Um, in a really, um, I find it really ugly when I look at the historical images because not only did they they sort of went street by street. So imagine over where, again, if you're familiar with the city, over where the East Campus of UMass Lowell is, where all the dorms are, the rec center. If you're a hockey fan and you've gone to any hockey games at the Songus Arena or a baseball fan and you've gone to the Lasher Park, all of that was tenements, stores, that was a vibrant neighborhood of a couple thousand people. Um, And that was just knocked down and as each building was knocked down, it was actually lit on fire. So I have photographs of the bulldozers knocking buildings over and the next street over, people are sort of next and they're waiting, but they're also watching what's happening in their neighborhood as sort of systematically um, this neighborhood is taken down. I'm starting, a, I've been bugging the university, I don't know how far I'm going to get yet, but I'll, I'll put it out on air now too, so maybe people will support the effort. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, UMass Lowell. Um, I want the, I would like the university and all the buildings on East Campus to actually create a little mini history exhibit in the entryways of all the buildings that would say, before this, this is what this neighborhood was. Oh, have I photographs and have a little short of bre- abbreviated version of the history of the Little Canada neighborhood and the fact that it got knocked down. So that particularly students, but also other people that come and go, that go into the ballpark or go into the arena or whatever, can understand a little bit about what that history was. And so the other day I started a Facebook campaign um, on my Facebook page to a- asking anybody that had photographs of the neighborhood to send me them. Oh, wow. So that, and I said, I don't want photos of the buildings being knocked down. I want photos of people. I want to mm-hmm. see photos of families going to church on Easter Sunday. I want to see Christmas parties. I want to see markets and stores. I don't want to see it when it's knocked down. That defeats right. the purpose of trying to show people. And I think, again, that's what's missing. If you go around Lowell and you know the history, I do wish there was a, a bit more signage out and about. I mean, the park does a good job inside the park mm-hmm. telling the story, but it's inside the park. Right. We've got a lot of wall space and we've got a lot of places where we could put, you know, memories over behind where you are and that where, you know, where Girls Inc. is. That was a Greek neighborhood. Wow. That whole area, right? Right around where the Greek church is and right, where, the, yeah. where, the housi- where the public housing is now, mm-hmm. all along there, that was another neighborhood that was bulldozed down. Mm. That wow. was knocked down in the 40s and, and 50s. So you still see the remnants of that with the Greek yeah. restaurants that are over there and the little trout. There's a market travel agency right over there, up market and whatever. But again, the neighborhood's gone. It's so much culture that gets lost. Yep. And uh, this was the thing that uh, Christoph had even mentioned. I didn't think about until we were talking about the indigenous people who were here, but even digging up the canals, how much history was lost, mm-hmm. artifacts and any kind of any way to tell what was going on Mm -hmm. before that because it was all dug up for the canals to be built, uh, well, for the canals and for all the mills to be Mm -hmm. built. And you just think about how much history is lost in that kind of way. I mean, they did do a couple of archaeological digs in front of St. Patrick's Church. 
wow. um, not too long ago. They did this exchange program the university had with, I forget which university in Ireland, and some of our students went there and did a dig, and then some of their students worked on doing, and they were trying to do the same thing. They were excavating some plots in front of the church where the green, where the green space is in front of the church to see if they could find, because that was um, the acre neighborhood where the first Irish lived, and they, uh, they found you know, pipes and corncob pipes and things like that. They found rosary beads, found some cracked pottery, things like that. But I don't think, they were hoping they would find like a foundation of a house or something yeah. like that or more. They didn't quite find, but that's the problem with those digs. You've got to do a lot of them. Maybe then you strike gold. But you're right, the, as buildings are knocked down and then their foundations are filled in or whatever, you, you, can, you can lose um, whatever history. I was in France a few years ago at a conference in Paris and in the neighborhood where I was staying they were doing one of these kind of archaeological digs and I mean French history is obviously a lot longer in terms of you know settlement here versus there and so they were digging down, they had dug down I think what must have been maybe 15 or 20 stories into the ground wow. and they sort of were, were layering all these sections by time um, to sort of like sort of periodize French history and see, and in each layer then they, when they uncovered things, they would, you know, they would date them um, and then they would dig further and then find other things and date them and I don't, I mean, I don't know if they were digging, you know, through the middle of the earth or how far <laughs> down they were actually <laughs> going to go, um, but it was really, it, you know, you could do something like that here, um, you know, as Professor Strobel said, like to look for um, in certain parts of the city that are somewhat undisturbed, like over in Pawtucketville or maybe right around the junction of where the Concord and the Merrimack Rivers join. Mm -hmm. You could probably do some digging right around there on the edges and you might find some things. But yeah, the history is everywhere. Wow. And, and we live in such a historical place that people don't realize. And like you said, I think these plaques would be a great idea so people can really see what kind of vibrant communities mm -hmm. were here before well, they were quite literally bulldozed down and burned right in front of um, other people's neighbors and everything like that. And, and, and imagine even just living in that time and we're talking about losing history, but losing your own sense of community right. is it's so difficult. Yeah, and that was, I mean, in that period, there were lots of, there were still French language newspapers that would circulate in that neighborhood. Um, you know, it was a really vibrant French language church. St. Joseph's Hospital, which was there, was staffed by lots of French-speaking nuns as, you know, nurses and um, where, the uni where University Crossing is now. And so, I mean, there's just so much that just got, you know, sort of abandoned. And so I'm hoping that the university will realize, and I, th I think part of the university's reticence is to say something might make people think it was the university that knocked the neighborhood down. Mm. Um, no, the, un the university had nothing to do with knocking the neighborhood down. The, na the neighborhood was knocked down by a vote of the Lowell City Council right. in the early 1960s before the university was ever thinking of expanding um, into that part of the city. It was, of course, on you know where North Campus is now. It was there, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the motivator. It didn't say knock that neighborhood down so we can build a dorm there. I mean, it became the beneficiary because the original vision was to knock it all down. And then the thought was that all these high tech companies mm -hmm. in Boston around MIT and whatever wouldn't be able to afford to stay there as they grew. And they would be looking for some places to build new factories. And then if there was all this cleared land, so imagine the space all the way from you know, where Fox Hall, the big high rise dorm is now, all the way down to the arena, that was essentially just like clear cut. Wow. There was just a big empty space and parking lots. Wow. Um, and so that was the idea, but it never came to fruition. And so then when the university begins to think about becoming less of a commuter school and more of a, of a school with dormitories and students living on campus, it's like, wow, right across, you know, right on our doorstep literally is this vacant land. Let's see what we can do with it. And so ultimately come the dorms first along the river, then the big Fox Hall, and obviously now the university keeps growing and growing um, in that neighborhood. But um, so I, I want students, when they're walking around there, to understand who lived there before they yeah. did. Just seems to make sense to me. 
It's important, especially if you're on an academic campus anyway. Why not be learning all the time? Yeah, one would think, <laughs> right? I mean, and the beauty part of it is, too, that it's the kind of project where you can get lots of students involved. So I'm working with students to uncover, the, uncover more of the history. They're helping accumulate photos and you know, oral histories and things like that. So we're ready, if, if when the university says yes, we're ready to go um, mm -hmm. because we've been working on this for over a year. Um, and so I'm determined to do it, whether they, some <laughs> night when they're not, when they're all sleeping, up will go the signs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I still have that little radical part of me from when I was a kid. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll put the signs up anyway, one way or the other. <laughs> I'm down, Bob I'm just, Street uh, team. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm just, I'm, you know, put the handcuffs on me now. I'm, t I'm admitting <laughs> I'm committing a crime. <laughs> but I mean, one way or the other, we're going to, you know, I mean, I don't think, I think eventually they'll say, yeah, let's do it. Um, right. They yeah. are putting signs up in University Crossing that talk about the fact that it had been a hospital that serviced oh, that good. neighborhood and they're doing that. This, so, so that gave me the idea that, okay, now we can persuade them to do this other piece too. Wow. Wow. That's, oh, I'm so glad that you're working on that project. Yep. So like that one, yeah. and then and then the Greek neighborhood, um, want to do that one. Then put some signage in the train station, Gallagher Terminal, oh, yes. because over where that was, that was a Jewish neighborhood. Yeah, see, no, um, nobody would know. No, nobody would know unless you unless you're you know, quite old and or you have family that was part of the mm -hmm. the Jewish community in Lowell at the time that had themselves displaced right. by by Gallagher. And so there's a lot of that history and a lot of people. Um, who were forced to leave Lowell. Like a lot of the people that lived in Little Canada, didn't, they just moved away. Um, some people moved to other parts of the city, Pawtucketville or wherever, but other people just simply left the city. The church ended up closing because the parishion, you know, there wasn't enough of a, of a parishion or base. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's all this history. Wow. And then we come to the recent history where we see uh, these immigrant populations coming in, like many from different regions of Africa yep. and then even other places in Southeast Asia. And we see that that sense of community and culture is kind of coming back and thriving mm -hmm. and, and almost in a way that it's like repeating history in a, in a positive way. Yeah, they're definite. I mean, this, this, they're sort of iconic things that people do when they move someplace and have figured out they're going to stay. Mm -hmm. One of those is to be is to build some sort of a religious institution, um, whatever serves your faith, and so you can see that with recent populations that have come in, where there have been storefront, you know, Pentecostal churches, storefront churches in different parts of the city, then slowly growing into more established religious institutions. In some cases, buying an empty church that had been like a Polish church or whatever, like 75 years ago, and was empty, and now it's becoming, uh, you know, a Ghanaian church or whatever it is. And so you see, you see that, you see food, you see markets mm -hmm. that go up in, in, in predominantly immigrant and or refugee neighborhoods across the city, little, little mom and pop markets that are selling fruits and vegetables that are typical of the home country that are bringing in foodstuffs that people are familiar with, certain kind of baked goods or whatever it might be. And, you know, again, similar to if you're traveling on Broadway where Olympos Bakery is or whatever, right? I mean, that's right. the same remnant of it, right? And you see these things, you know, just continually repeating themselves. You see, as happened in the immigrant communities from the earlier days till now, um, second generation, a kid, so if, if immigrants came and then they parented kids who were born here, the focus on education became really important mm -hmm. as sort of the way up, right? Sort of the way people think about economic mobility. and see that now at the university where there's tons of kids who are the second and in some cases third generation, mm -hmm. particularly of Southeast Asian immigrants who came in um, in the 70s and early 80s from refugee camps in Thailand and elsewhere after the Vietnam War. And you see it the same with, um, you know, the children of African, um, you know, emigres coming in. They're doing the same thing. So the university is transforming itself too. The, pop wow. the student population is reflective in some ways of this sort of this historical trend as well which is really fascinating that is especially i feel like we talk about a lot of the negatives over history and the displacement and you know the strikes and everything but i feel like here we are coming full circle where maybe urban renewal might have been a terrible thing let's just call it what it, is. it was a terrible thing at that time especially with all of the displacement and um, the disbanding and destroyment of community. Uh, 
But then we got to have this great university right in our backyard, and all of these immigrants who are coming here now mm -hmm. get to take full advantage of something that maybe they wouldn't have had otherwise, yep. especially if they came here as refugees or second generation, third generation, who experience terrible tragedy in yep. their lives. No question. And when you do oral histories with, which I've done with recent, you know, recent immigrants and or refugees, one of the things when you talk to them about why settle in low, one of the things they'll almost always talk about is Middlesex Community College and the university, that they see that those are pathways for their kids. Um, and so it is true that if you, you know, between Lowell High and Middlesex and the university, you can, without leaving, if you don't want to, you can go from high school to a PhD um, in all sorts of fields. And so it is, a, it is a, a, a strength of the city that sometimes I wonder if people actually fully appreciate. Yeah. Um, and so it's obviously I'm biased since I've spent the last 25 years of my <laughs> life working at the university. But I mean, I find it to be a tremendous asset, um, just as you described. And it is one of the draws, along with lots of other things, um, that brings people here. It's really great, too, that the university works with the national parks to make sure that our history is being told and that people are actually grasping it, though, like your walking tours, mm -hmm. yours and decals. And it's just, I love that we're able to learn no matter what. We're, we're like, like even now, I get to learn from you on this, um, this pretty awesome show. Cause <laughs> right, say, absolutely. We're, we're doing a great job. We're waiting for the <laughs> Emmy. I don't know what's happening, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> a little further down the road maybe, but anyway, we'll get there. We'll get there. And it just, when I, when I think of Lowell, and I think of all of the history that we've talked about and everything that we're coming up to now, and the things that I'm seeing in the community, we're still a place that focuses on collaboration and working together. And as disjointed and disbanded as cultural communities have become, we're still learning how to work together mm -hmm. and overcome adversity and overcome any kind of challenges that are posed to us no matter where they're coming from. And I think that it, it's only taken about 200 years, but we're yeah. slowly making some we're progress. We're slowly getting there, right. <laughs> I mean, one of the benefits of living in Lowell is that you can do a world food tour. Oh, yes. Right, <laughs> I mean, you could start in the morning, get breakfast somewhere, and you could finish up with dessert and a drink at 11 p.m. <laughs> and have traveled the world by just sort of, actually, that actually would be a good, that wouldn't be a walking tour, that would be a eating and driving tour, but that actually <laughs> would be a cool thing to set up. Sort of go to, make sure that at the end of the day you went to every continent. That would be so um, amazing. I don't know if we got an Antarctica restaurant. But, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, and so, I, you know, if you see that you can, and understand it and appreciate it, it's like, wow, what a cool place to live. Um, and I think, right, the university having, paying attention to, more so I think now than ever before, sort of telling that Lowell story and getting students out more into the community and pushing students to appreciate more the place where they are, where 20 years ago or 25 years ago, the, the university was very isolated. Right. Um, and I think there's much more encouragement to, to, to get out. I mean, the other big thing that I think will happen coming up, right, is that the International Institute um, is in 2018 celebrating its, it, now we're in the 100th anniversary of the inter Institute's founding in Lowell. And I'm gonna be working with them on a bunch of things that will start happening in, like, in September, um, including a history of the organization and a conference on immigration history in Lowell and a whole bunch of other stuff. And so that'll be another way to sort of gather the story and get the word out. And that will be looking at 1918 to 2018, which is really rich in terms of what we've talked about. Definitely. Oh, wow. I'm so glad. All of the projects that you're doing, I'm so excited about. I can't yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really only 30, but all these projects <laughs> have aged me considerably. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what makes you distinguished, right? <laughs> I guess, yeah. It's the gray hair that makes me distinguished. I don't know. But, you know, I think it's really important that we're highlighting the work that the International Institute has been doing, especially with uh, refugees and immigrants being such a hot button topic. And for Lowell, it's been so relevant mm -hmm. in so many different ways. So it's really important to acknowledge that we've come a long way mm -hmm. and we and we are maybe not officially, but we are a sanctuary for people. And we're I think that we're going to continue to be that or at least strive to be some of us maybe um, and 
continue to work together. Yeah, I mean, the city has no choice. Yeah. If the city's in the world and the world comes to Lowell, I mean, mm -hmm. Lowell is a world city, whether um, some people in Lowell don't want, you know, want it to be or don't want it to be, it doesn't make any difference. You can't hold back that historical tide. And so we either, we either figure out how to adjust to it and make it all work and do the best by everybody, or we end up in this very antagonistic place, but the antagonistic place isn't going to get us anywhere over time. It's just going to make us upset and, and irritable, but it's not really going <laughs> to solve the problem. People are going to come. It's just, it's the nature of what's happening in the world today. Exactly. And deal, we, ha we have to deal with it. I think historically, Lowell's had its fits and starts of sort of how it negotiates that terrain, but more often than not, in the end, the tendency is to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that's just one of the beautiful things about Lowell. Mm -hmm. We really do, we come together and the community uses its voice and I think that's pretty epic. And that's how we got that whole highway dome project to stop right yep. <laughs> Yeah, the highway dome project <laughs> stopped. Also, the connector, right? Right. That's another one, I mean, story for another day, but the connector stops where it stops because people wanted to build it right through the Portuguese neighborhood. And the people in the Portuguese neighborhood in back central and over, you know, up along Lawrence Street and whatever said, no, this isn't happening. Um, and organized themselves and fought City Hall and won. So the one thing that keeps coming up over and over again, we have to work together, we have to be organized, and we have to appreciate each other. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. I and here we are. And here we are. I appreciate you, Bob. And I you. <laughs> And I appreciate all of you who tune in. Thank you so much. And we hope you come back for more History and Lowell.